Hey there, it's the Unique History Channel. Tonight we're going to be doing a selected reading from Napoleon Life, Legacy, and Image, a biography. It's by Alan Forrest. And we'll be reading Chapter 5, Lure of the Orient. This isn't just dispatch Bonaparte to Egypt to concentrate so much of France's renewed military effort on a colonial war seemed bizarre to many, especially since the Directory had devoted effort during the previous months to planning a full-scale invasion of Britain. Britain had become, for the country's political leaders, the most dangerous and determined of France's enemies, a colonial power prepared to use its great wealth to deny French expansion on the continent and assume the role of paymaster to counter-revolution across Europe. And the circumstances for an assault on Britain had seemed a suspicious, and the evidence of radical subversion in London, the naval immunities in Nor and Spithead, and the constant murmurs of rebellion from Ireland. The directors had a good reason to believe in 1796 and 1797 that their moment had come and that they had might at last hope to break the resistance of France's most stubborn and affluent enemy. They were already pursuing an economic war against Britain, and they had become increasingly intolerant of what they interpreted as Britain interference over peacemaking, a refusal to compromise French gains in northern Italy, especially along the Assertion of the Scheldt. This context was in which Bonaparte had been appointed to the head of the army of England and prepared an invasion plans. Ahead the, but by 1798, there was a good reason to fear that moment, if it had indeed ever existed, had passed, and that a successful invasion of England would require mobilization of huge resources that were beyond the capabilities of the French Navy. The condition of the ga- Navy ga- caused for alarm, and Bonaparte, on a tour of inspections of the naval ports, was quick to conclude that the idea of a direct frontal assault from the sea was risky at best, and at worst, sadly misconceived. On the other hand, as he reported to the directors in February 1798, there were perhaps more hopeful alternative strategies for attacking the British and their interests. By the land, he argued, the more practical policy would be to attack Hanover and Hamburg, which would harm British commercial interests in Germany and Northern Europe, or by English's sea colonies abroad, where the Royal Navy would be less concentrated and Britain's armies more stretched. The third strategy, Napoleon suggested to mount an attack on the Levant that would disrupt British command of the Eastern Mediterranean and threaten her trade with the Indies. At this moment, he gave no hint of his own preference, but he had sown the idea in many people's mind that one way of staunching the flow of wealth of Britain was to cut off communications with its colonial possessions, especially the richest among them, India. Attack on Egypt would be a mechanism for destroying British power in the Indian subcontinent. It would also provide France with a delicious dose of revenge for the repeated colonial defeats she had suffered at the hands of the British in the course of a century. The directors, or at least the majority among them, would have seemed to be convinced by this argument, especially the number of ships and mobilization of resources required for an attack on Egypt was fractional of what had been discussed for an invasion of England. Since the reign of Louis, the French had periodically dreamed of conquering Egypt. Choussel had considered it in the loss of French Canada and the colonies in India. Their gens, although, had opposed the idea of preferring to offer French support to the American colonists against Britain in 1778. Bonaparte himself was clearly attracted by the idea of leading military assault on Egypt, whether in order to advance his own interests or promote a new colonial policy that could be achieved without, uh, without resort to slavery. His enthusiasm for the policy is attested by the contemporaries and especially those in his more intimate circle. One of those most faithful was Bonaparte, a former classmate at Brienne, who went on to become his personal secretary and who left what he claimed to be a faithful account of his master's thoughts and utterance. Through many of these had been exposed as pure fiction. Already in 1797, he has Bonaparte claiming, with apparent precise, that the time was not far distant from when, if he was really ready to destroy England, we must seize control of Egypt. And writing to the Directory's new foreign minister, Talleyrand, reminding him of the strategic value of Egypt, 
and adding it that it was a great power vacuum waiting to be occupied a territory that belongs to only God himself. What is certainly true is that Napoleon was an early convert to the strategy of mounting assault on the eastern Mediterranean. Even while he was still in Italy preparing for the terms of Camp- Campo Fortimo, he is reported by a much more reliable source, Mille di Mito, which had been discussing a possible invasion of Egypt. Talleyrand, even ever the schemer, was an eager player in his particular diplomatic, diplomatic game, quickly went over to the grand scheme of making the Nile into a French-controlled waterway and thus cutting off England from its richest colonial possessions. He realized, too, that for political reasons, it must be he himself and not Bonaparte who took policy initiatives since the directors were jealous to guard political power for themselves and instinctively distrusted the young general who had dictated the peace terms at Campo Forimo. They were, of course, so naive to be decepted by the political maneuvers of Talleyrand, which were fairly ex- ex- transparent, nor yet by the two reports he had submitted to them extravagating the threat posed by Turkey to justify a French attack on the Levant. But they did not allow themselves to be conceived of value in a campaign in North Africa, although which they gave their consent to expedition, they did so with the deepest misgivings. Napoleon had made no secret of his boredom back in Paris or his impatience for another glorious campaign. The last thing they could afford was to hand out the political initiative to their over ambitious general. Where did Napoleon's dreams of the Orient and his apparent passion for the idea of Egypt adventure originate? The whole enterprise was far removed from the military world he knew, a land of armies and long marches, of artillery attacks on towns and fortifications, a world punctuated by alpine passes and the wide plains of Lombardy. Now his army would face an entirely different and very unfamiliar landscape, a landscape of sand and desert, but also of temples and pyramids, tombs and sphinxes, and marches in a blazing heat that few Europeans had experienced. The Egypt they sailed towards was not just a foreign country, it was a culture in which the French understood little, but which held a unique fanation for them. An ancient civilization of closely held secrets and strange religious rituals, locked houses, walled courtyards, veiled faces, and sweeping robes. It was above all, as Napoleon's friend and cultural advisor, the engraver Vion Dion, Dionin, Observed after landing in Alexandria, a deep, a land of deep silence. There was, it seemed to the French, no conversation in the street, no laughter, no scampering children or barking dogs. Egypt seemed profoundly melancholy, unwelcoming, and inward-looking. And for many of the French soldiers, this was the dominant image they would retain of North Africa and particularly of Islam. The first image came into view. Dion wrote of Alexandria was a vast cemetery covered by countless tombs of white marble against a white soil. A few skinny women draped in long, torn clothing were like ghosts as they wandered among these monuments. The silence was broken only by the screeching of kites as they circled around the century, sanctuary of death. It was a bleak image in the minds of the French, contrasted the starkly the color and the gaiety of the European cities they had left behind. But that image only took shape once the French army had reached Egypt and become acquainted with the country and its people. Before they left French soil, there was abundant evidence that, like Napoleon himself, they shared a fascination with the Orient So that so typified Western Europe in the second half of the 18th century. They were not talking of a poor society or an undeveloped one. Egypt in the mid-century was a rich and artistically sophisticated nation, part of the Turkish Empire of the day, and carried on in a flourishing trade with Europe, especially France. The country was framed for its delicate carved woodwork and its skilled craft cultures, and visitors from Europe returned home with tales of opulent palaces, bustling markets, and most particularly in the cities such as Cairo, Rosetta, and Alexandria. Cairo, indeed, was a true southern capital, a great city with commercial links all around the Mediterranean. But these privileged conditions were changing rapidly, a consequence of chronic political instability and the old Egyptian Empire had given a long way to the rule of a province of Turkey with instability as a permanent threat. In 1766, the country was rent by the rising Emir Ali Bey to overthrow the Turkish yoke 
establish his own autocratic rule. Political crisis followed, and he was assassinated in 1773, resulting in a further political instability and economic decline, and leading in 1786 to a short-lived attempt to be a Turkish ruler, the Sublime Prote, to reestablish his nation's control. As a consequence, by the time Napoleon and his men arrived, they had found not the luxury and the general prosperity they had read about in earlier travelers' accounts, but an economy in tatters and a populace reduced to dire poverty. Many had nourished hopes of finding an exotic paradise steeped in precious objects and guided fabrics. They were to be bitterly disappointed. Napoleon undoubtedly left France with a more romanticized notion of what he would encounter an imperial vision of the great civilization he was about to conquer. His reading of history had stood him in good stead. He knew about the ancient civilizations of Egypt and Persia, just as he had read about the classical authors of Greece and Rome. He was already conscious of the awesome step he was taking in trying to annex an ancient empire to the ascendant star of revolutionary France. Bonaparte was not modest about his talents or his ambitions. In correspondence, he compared himself to Alexander the Great, imposing new modern civilization into that one had become decadent and outmoded. Indeed, the belief that Western Europe was an empire in the ascendant, facing the last corrupt vestiges of past civilizations, would seem to have intoxicated him. When he left for the Orient, he took with him an impressive array of great works of his own century, notably those of Montesquieu, Voltaire, and Rousseau, as well as some of the authors of the Antiquity. These may have been predictable, the standard text of any well-read man of the Enlightenment, but it's interesting that he thought to read them on a campaign. He also took Voyages of Captain Cook, one of the most intellectual texts in of exploration and discovery of the exotic. Goethe's romantic and melancholy so- Sorrows of the Young Witherer, and specifically the Quran, which he thought to familiar himself with for beginning his talks with the Egyptians. All in all, it was fairly Catholic mixture, but one showed that a man immersed in transnational culture of the late 18th century and excited by an encounter with a great, though poorly understood, extra European civilization. There was far more in his fascination with Egypt than desire to cut off Britain from its colonial possessions. His fascination with the culture of the Orient took other forms. 2. Though his critics have been deeply cynical about his real-life motives, a thirsty for military glory, and an enlightened curiosity about one of the world's greatest civilizations can sometimes go hand in hand. We know that Napoleon's youthful reading of the classics had left him a deep mark on him, and that it was not out of character for him to leave Levi, Pultecrec, or Teactus on campaign. Nor was it acceptable in an age when the officers of European armies were still molded with aristocratic values and for army commanders to be cultivated, sometimes well-read men. In the peninsula, for instance, British officers read the most recent novels of Walter Scott, while most of France's generals, Chaudoros de la Cosse, is probably the most remembered author of one of the most provocative novels in the 18th century, Les Liaisons Don Jarisos. Lycos may have been a libertine and in the eyes of distractors a pornographer, but he was also until his death in Napoleon's service near Naples, 1803, a dedicated artillery officer. To his contemporaries, there was nothing strange or contradictory about these roles, so with Napoleon, a few would have pointed to any tension between his success as an army officer and his avowed interest in the ancient world any more that it would be seen that an artillery officer should claim to be a talented mathematician. What is clear, however, is that he went to some excessive lengths to ensure that his intellectual gifts were recognized by the public and to win such esteem and the kudos as associations with the science could confer. Thus, in 1797, following the departure of Karna, a fellow artillery officer, Bonaparte assumed the seat he evacuated at the French Academy. He therefore, he thereafter took care when in Paris to be seen in the company of the most prominent intellectuals of his day. In the eyes of many of his biographies and some contemporaries, this was a step too far, a distinction that 
in no way could be justified, but a blatant win over France's intellectual elite. Such criticisms counted for little when Bonaparte himself, he flaunted his membership of the Academy and routinely palace member of the Institute, first among his various titles and honors, even before his military rank. For all this, the main objective of the Egyptian campaign was the conquest of a faraway land very different from the revolutionary mantra of defending the fatherland, of fighting for a la patria in danger, or the country in danger. Some of the more revolutionary of the generals remarked on this, there is no doubt such as Kibler, who still held firm to Republican ideas, was uneasy about this mortality of this new development in French diplomacy that condemned them to fight what they saw as imperialistic wars. Was that no significant evidence of the safety of the French, that had no evident significance for the safety of French civilian population. But Napoleon allowed himself no such doubts. He would talk afterwards of the Egyptian campaign as a war conducted in the interests of civilization. His correspondence at the time, he would not conceal his desire to be understood by the Arab world as a savior of the glorious civilization. Writing from Cairo to the governor of Syria, Ahmad Ahmed the Ajar, in August 1798, he explained in the passage the sensibilities of the revolution and that in Egypt, he was not in Egypt to attack people or their beliefs or to punish their rulers. I have not, he said, come to make war on the Muslims. When he landed in Egypt, he added, I reassured the people and offered protection to the muftis, the imams, and the mosques. The pilgrims to Mecca, whenever never have been welcomed with greater warmth and friendship. The festival of the prophet has been celebrated with more splendor than ever. The intended interference was clear. A Western leader who did not make come with assumptions of innate superiority and who had studied the Quran and would treat Islam as an equal of Christianity and who could be trusted to respect the cultural treasures of ancient Egypt. It made for a powerful propaganda offensive, though it did not deceive the Egyptians for long. There was certainly something mildly exotic about the military expedition that set sail from France, some 300 ships in the spring of 1798, an expedition in which Napoleon had assembled and in case of many of his prisoners personally inspired the 36,000 troops, including units drawn from the armies in Germany and Italy, armies that had very different traditions and whose relations were marked by a degree of rivalry. They were well supplied with officers, over 2,200 in all. Bonaparte's own entourage, unsurprisingly, was drawn from officers he had come to know and trust in Italy and would continue to operate as an inner circle on his new campaign. They were competent, often brilliant soldiers who succeeded in the very challenging task of adapting quickly to the fighting conditions they encountered in North Africa. But it was not the presence of the army that most remarked upon Toulon, but rather the incorporation of around 160 of France's most dig- distinguished scientists, archaeologists, and engineers, men of duties in Egypt who had nothing to do with the progress of the military, but were charged with exploring Egyptian monuments, pyramids, and archaeological sites and ancient inscriptions. Their task was to investigate every aspect of ancient Egyptian culture, to record its splendors and catalog its remains, to transcribe its languages and identify its species of animals and birds. They were there because of Bonaparte and Bonaparte alone. It was his idea to adapt the expedition for our cultural as well as military goals. In his personal prestige, which had led the scientists from all over France to agree to participate in the first place, it was his conception too that from the outset the military consequence and the scientific discovery would be closely associated twin pillars of the same imperial enterprise. The idea was not wholly without precedent. The 18th century had a period of ambitious scientific exploration, including circumnavigations of the world by two great Frenchmen, Bougainville in 1766-69 and La Perouse in 1785-1788. And there were, of course, classical predecessors to follow. Napoleon was very conscious in the fact that he was following in the footsteps of a great predecessor, and as marches to Egypt, Persia, and India, Alexander the Great had taken with him a band of learned men and philosophers to explore the lands they passed through.
There is little doubt that Napoleon saw himself as the new Alexander the Great. Not everyone in the army was persuaded of the wisdom of this approach, which they interpreted as the delusion of their military endeavor, especially since their general seemed to favor les, les savions and their work over the military targets of the expedition. While the cost of the archaeological work and hiring artists to record the monuments came out of the military budget, but there was a long return political here goal that could not be overlooked, since it was that allowed Bonaparte to present himself not as just a military conqueror, but as the bearer of civilization. Indeed, almost all of his first action on arriving in North Africa was to create an institute of Egypt in Cairo, a place where scholars could meet and discuss cultural matters, and a new science of Egyptology could be evolved. There was a more hint in dis- diplomacy in this, as well as the immediate publicity coup. He came to Africa with an understanding of culture and antiquity, concerned to cherish, discover and cherish Africa's heritage, whereas the British, who had fleet had withdrawn from in- Egypt only the previous year, were presented as new barbarians, a trading people whose only interest in Africa lay in opportunities for profit and commercial exploitation. Of course, in reality, Napoleon's own motives were far more complex and in no sense altruistic. For him, it was about control and power, what Edward Said would represent as the European pursuit of total knowledge and total control over the Oriental society as the original sin in the modern nexus of the homogic Western power and knowledge. The military campaign did not go so smoothly. This was to be no repeat of the rapid succession of victories that Napoleon had enjoyed against the Austrians in Lombardy, and although the first action of advancing the fleet was undoubtedly a triumph. The French had bullied and bribed the Knights of St. John to surrender their fortress city of Valletta and seized the strategically placed island of Malta for France. They then sailed on the coast of Africa where they faced a very different army, a force of Mamluks, with trivial battle tactics and little sense of European strategy. They were distinguished and Europeanized by their Europe- Oriental uniforms, their curved shimmerters, and their disorganized contact on the battlefield. Against them, the French won some noble battles and fought against memorable and exotic backgrounds, particularly the Battle of the Pyramids in July 1789 where French losses of 300 contrasted dramatically with the Mamelukes, 2,500. In open battle, the French enjoyed a clear advantage in which they maintained even after Porte declared war and they had to face the Turkish as well as the Egyptian forces in the field. In 1799, for instance, they celebrated comprehensive victories at Mount Tabor and Aboukir, crossing home their advantage in a succession of engagements. But these were the high points of the campaign that spelt mixed fortune, military fortunes for Napoleon. His navy was effectively destroyed by British under Hortillo Nelson when the two fleets met at the Battle of the Nile in the first states of the August 1798. As a consequence of these victories, the British were handed effective control of the Eastern Mediterranean and denied the French the possibility of gaining supplies and reinforcements for their army, which proved a decisive blow. On land, Bonaparte found his tactical op- options dramatically reduced. He was forced to move north into Syria to face the Turks, but he has found his army fatally weakened by fevers and worst of all by bubonic clay which struck his troops in Yaffa. Morale plummeted and desperation set in. They were cut off from supplies of food and water. He besieged Saint Jean d'Or. By this time, his Turretian and Incisiveness were not enough for the city supplied by the British from sea. It was a gallowing defeat for Bonaparte, and one that which led him to renounce his objective of taking Acre and to retreat with the remnants of his army across the sun-baked desert to Cairo. An expedition that had started so promisingly had ended in failure, despite the fact that the French had won a series of of lightning victories and destroyed two Turkish armies, 
In military terms, it had been impressive performance, though the work of the army was undermined by French naval weakness and by the crushing British naval victory at the Nile. But Napoleon could justly feel that his achievement went beyond the purely military. In his dealings with civil society, he had impressed upon Egypt and its people his interest in them and their, their land, and his concerns for the ruin of their past and his evident interest in Islam. Just as importantly, he had built up a solid working relationship with local people and laid the foundations of a French colony in Egypt. Yet, a retreat from Acre was that of a beaten army. Stragglers were cut down by Turkish fighters, and while many of the men, their bodies were weakened by plague or raided by disease, fell by the wayside. Dying soldiers sought opium to end their sufferings, and others in despair at what they were living through committed suicide in front of their officers. At Yaffa, some 1,200 of the most seriously ill were placed on boats to be transported to a hospital in Damietta, and those who were able to walk were forced to march on with the beraggled and demoralized remnants of an army blowing up the defenses of every town they passed through and taking hostage from among the local population. When they finally reached Cairo, when they finally reached Cairo, they were dirty, exhausted, and often more mortally weakened by plague, glad only that their hell was over and that a food and change of uniform awaited them. The campaign, it seemed, had ended in disaster sufficiently so for Bonaparte to order the burning of some of the expedition's records, but that was not the way you know, the way it made appear. At the approach to Cairo, the French were greeted as conquering heroes. Napoleon had already taken steps to ensure the impression of victory was maintained Whatever the true cost of the campaign may have been, and the sheiks of Cairo were outside ga- to the gates, welcoming them with horse, gifts, camels, and slaves. His soldiers must have been confused to hear what theirs had been a brilliant triumph that the enemy army, which was marching to invade e- Egypt, was destroyed. Or the decision had been taken to turn back from the castle of Acre because it's not worth the loss of any more time. It was all untrue, but if of course, Napoleon had already learned the principal rule of the propagandists that he should never feel constrained by the truth. His reputation for invincibility was in jeopardy, and all the more so when he abandoned his army, defeated and demoralized in Egypt to return to France. He understood the importance of winning over opinion back home, of making his fellow Frenchmen aware of what he had achieved in North Africa, proud to count the campaign in Egypt as a notable French success. But to do that, he had to conduct another campaign, one shaped in words and images. As had become clear in Italy, Napoleon was ever aware that the esteem and kudos that could occur from his military talents, he had never hesitated to make most of his achievements, parading them before the army and the French people alike. But in Italy, he had a succession of remarkable victories to present to admiring public whereas in Egypt, in similarly triumphal terms, might have seemed well nigh impossible. However, the very distance between Paris and Cairo and the color and the exoticism of the desert were predictories of the Egyptian campaign that he could manipulate and which ultimately played into his hands. Here he did not dwell on the length of the outcomes of battle, but could put emphasis on the cultural mission which he saw himself fulfilling, a mission that ensured France's place among the great civilizations of the world. As he had in Italy, he published two sheets from Egypt, each with a distinct audience in mind. The Corriere de l'Egypte was targeted primarily at the troops, which allowed Bonaparte to present his own versions of events and dismiss damaging rumors. Again, there was a clear emphasis on cultural policy with historical and cultural articles, pieces about the new improved administration, and articles praising the high quality of the Islamic elites and boasting their cordial relations with France. But after your initial issues published in France, and weeks before the fleet sailed to North Africa, poor communications and long distances ensured the courier was little read back home, though experts from it were sometimes printed in the Montier, always to Napoleon's advantage. The second publication, Blood. Okay, let me try to pronounce this. 
Laudecate Egyptian was more a competently scholarly. Its mission to report on the work of Napoleon's Egyptian Institute and discuss Egyptian antiques with the scientific community in France. In both papers, Napoleon was depicted as a multi-talented figure, at once a soldier and diplomat, a religious and cultural leader, and a representative of civilization in the forest land against exotic, exotic bath balls surrounded by Mamelukes, Sphinx, and pyramids. He represented France and the spirit of Grand Nation, the embodiment of French Republic and values explored to far-flung lands. Science stood side by side with ancient architecture, religious faith, with exoticism. His supporters would even claim that he worked miracles in Egypt, going so far as to implement he was being talked to, being talked of as a successor to Muhammad. Ma- Muhammad. It is increasingly interesting how the strangeness of the landscape and the richness of Egypt's heritage contributed to the construction of Napoleon's new identity how far he becomes as the days when he was exclusively seen as a brilliant general. For already in Egypt, it is clear he was seeking to present himself as a statesman, a diplomat, a man of honor and compassion, and a leader totally at ease with diverse cultures of the world. He was aided in this by Vivant Dion, whose real interests were always more artistic than military, and who confessed close up that he found little in war that was of real beauty. Dion was overwhelmingly grateful for the privilege of accompanying the expedition. The publication of his journal, detailing the wondrous discoveries they had made and the antiques they had uncovered in their marches across Egypt, was a major literary event in Paris, a play a significant role in popularizing Orientals in Western Europe. Napoleon lavished praise on the antiquity of scientists and men of letters who had accomplished the expedition. By doing so, he helped introduce French readers to a hitherto unknown world of Egyptian antiques. A new generation of imperial artists would perpetuate the sense Napoleon conducted himself in Levant, a civilized Frenchman, a man of the Enlightenment, a man of reason and sensibility. The Paris art market, liberalized during the Revolution, was reconstructed in the early years of the 19th century with government-inspired themes for competitions at the salons and generous prizes donated by the state. Large-scale history paintings were again in vogue, and artists vied with one another to present Bonaparte's victory at the Battle of the Pyramids, for instance. Such a subject offered a heaven-said opportunity to combine ideology to a regime with a suspendingly exotic back cloth of Arab horses and shamitars, palm trees and camels, or else they rushed to play victories at Abukar and Nazareth. Those were battle scenes, but the battle scenes were rich by their novic and exotic setting. Napoleon's artists did not, however, restrict themselves to questions of the tactics of military triumph. He also captured moments of generosity, sympathy, and forgiveness that suggest symptoms of true greatness. Two incidents that were taken from the campaign in the Levant provided striking examples of another side to Napoleon's nature. One was his readiness to forgive his enemies once they had surrendered to him, a principle which did not religiously adhere throughout the campaign, though after the interaction against French in Cairo, there was one such a moment. It was well captured in Napoleon pardoning rebels of Cairo, a canvas of 1808 by Pierre Narcion Guirion, which underlies in the simple nobility of the pardon and the power of life and death lay in the hand of Bonaparte's hand. In a series of pictures, many inspired by Dion's sketches, Antoine Jean Gros, a painter who was fascinated by the East and deeply regret- regretted not he had not been able to take part in the expedition, paid his own tributes to Napoleon. The most memorable focused on second incident when Bonaparte had visited the sick and dying in the hospital during the outbreak of the bubonic plague at Iaffa, evidencing hero of a quite different kind. In his Bonaparte visiting the plague stricken in Yaffa, Gross depicts the revolutionary general consoling plague victims, speaking to them about their woes, and even touching their wasted bodies. 
It was extraordinary. It was an extraordinary, iconic image, which would be repeated many times in popular photographs and cheap prints. And for Napoleonic art too, it would have important effects. The enormous popular success of the painting in the 1804 salon established once and for all the validity of large-scale propaganda propagandist reputations of contemporary events depicted in the l- language of classical history painting. By then, Napoleon had become fully aware of the value he could extort from representations of this kind. But science was more about propaganda. There's no reason to suppose Bonaparte's interest in Egypt stemmed from nothing more than cheap cynicalism. He shared the enthusiasm of his ling- linguists and artists, treasures of Egypt and the tombs and temples and gates and sphinxes. He expressed a curiosity about his its languages and inscriptions, and he revealed about the exotic, exotic landscape of the pyramids. The most enduring, many, many ways, was the most impressive outcome of the whole campaign, was the publication in Paris of the description, the description de l'Egypte, a series of. 24 lavishly entried volumes produced by the Savions after their return. These detailed scientific discoveries made during the expedition in an unveil to the world the wealth of antiques that had been unearthed by the French in Egypt. Most of the antiques remained in Egypt, though some were seized by the French and brought back to Paris. Precision in the Louvre. Mm. The most famous of them all, the Rosetta Stone, would be plundered for a second time by the British as a part of the final peace treaty and would find its home in the British in the British Museum. The description is a work of breathtaking ambition, introducing to Europe a world of temples and tombs, inscriptions and sculpture of which they knew little knowledge. Of the forty three offers, only two were specially co opted after the expedition returned. The others were all veterans of those months in the desert, pioneers who had volunteered to accompany Bonaparte on this great adventure who had explored the ancient so Egyptian civilization from the Mediterranean coast to the desert of the interior up to the Nile, Luxar, and Karnuk. They produced hundreds of engravings and entire volumes of plate, dividing the work into three discrete sections, Antiques, the Modern State, and Natural History, showing as a great interest in recent changed in the modernization of the Islamic world as they did in the remains of a world long lost. <clears throat> the propaganda value of the description, like that of the artist, would be the greatest in the future years, when it would help to cement Napoleon's image once he had already seized political power in France. By then it played on a familiar theme, for it can void an a more fuller and scientific form, the same message that he and his alcoholics were sending back to Paris from Egypt at the time, a message of that praised his diplomacy as much as his soldiering, his appreciation of the ancient ruins and exotic cultures, his tax and understanding of the wisdom. This message would have a powerful effect on opinion back home, and quite apart from his feeling more obvious task of ensuring that he was not forgotten, exiled beyond further extremities of Europe and abandoned to the oblivion. In correspondence of from the army of Egypt could itself be turned to the pro so glorifying Napoleon's role and emphasizing the high level of respect he commanded among the Egyptian elite. On july third, ni- seventeen ninety eight, for instance, the newspaper the Publicis ran an item on the hymn of sung by Cop Coptic choir in the Grand Mosque of Cairo to celebrate the entry of the city of Bonaparte to the head of the Braves of the West. The paper obligation hailed Bonaparte as the new Alexander and commented that his style letters were imitable from that of Julius Caesar himself. These we may safely conclude are the comparisons of which Napoleon would have approved and he may have suggested them in the first place. They played an important role in preparing the reception that would await him when he disembarked in his freyus from the ship that bore him and a few selected counselors back across the Mediterranean. They would also serve a valuable purpose in preparing the Napoleonic myth for future generations. Though the military expedition ended in defeat, Bonaparte was never able to 
offset the crippling blow inflicted by Nelson at Abukir Bay, which left him unable to guarantee supply of his army. The Egyptian adventure cannot be dismissed as a simple failure. The scientific team has been sure the French and their young general continued to be seen as explorers, humanists, men of science, bringing glories of an ancient civilization to the notice of the modern world. Administratively, he brought to Egypt many of the benefits in which he had bestowed on Italy. Laws, courts of justice, ready access to administration, and administration that was not staffed by corruption. In long return, the expedition helped to reshape France's relations with Egypt along into the 19th century. French engineers stayed on the army, pulled out, and helped the staff of the community's administration, country's administration. So in the short term, did Clebler and Mignon left by Napoleon to maintain French rule in Egypt. Their regime was talked as bringing progress and modernity. They succeeded in finding Egyptians ready and willing to serve France, but they could not turn the war or deter the British from attacking the last remnant of the French army. In all, French rule lasted a mere nine months. Clever was to die in Egypt, murdered by a patriotic student at the Azari Mosque in Cairo after repressing a popular rising in the city. Mamounou, on the other hand, was able to negotiate a safe departure from the last units of the French army before returning to France in 1802. They left behind a tradition of administration that was honest and efficient that ten years later, when Mehmet Ali ran the Mamluks out of Egypt and established a strong authoritarian state, he did not hesitate to borrow the administration practices which Bonaparte had established. In this respect, Napoleon's Egyptian legacy was not only destroyed among which the remnants of his armies, he helped to establish the French interests and in government practices in Egypt, and he has some claim to be acknowledged as the innovator and pioneer in colonial governance. Some French historians during the first half of the 20th century went rather seeing the colonization of Egypt, the beginnings of France's 19th century empire, and a prolonged to the colonization of Algeria in 1828. Okay, thank you.